So I'm Sean Davis. I'm at the National Cancer Institute at the National Institutes of Health. Um, I'm a pediatric oncologist, but for the last 15 years or so, I've been a biomedical data scientist. And uh, one of my research interests has been in um, data reuse and uh, building communities to enhance data reuse. Um, so it's a pleasure really to introduce uh, this session where we're gonna be talking to uh, some, some of the world's best uh, at um, uh, building communities around uh, data and data reuse. Um, I'm not gonna spend any time uh, introducing folks. What I thought we would do is to go through, you know, four to five minutes of introduction for each, each uh, panelist. And then after that, uh, we'll be doing uh, question, questions and answers. Um, so please feel free to uh, keep the questions coming. We'll try to mine them as best we can. Uh, but we'll also try to do some time, spend some time uh, with uh, open discussion. Um, all right, so with that, uh, we'll kick off with, um, with Keith Webster from Cardine Mellon University. Uh, then we'll move on to um, uh, Alison Specht from the University of Queensland, Australia. Then uh, Lucy Luang, uh, who we've heard, heard from already from the Allen Institute. Uh, and then finally, Ross Epstein from SafeGraph. Okay, Sean, thank you. Uh, can I just get a thumbs up so that you can see my slides? Yep, great. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for being part of this important event. We are um, always thrilled to collaborate with our colleagues across CMU and indeed across the planet in these events. Uh, I wanted to tee up this final session by saying a bit at a high level about community building. I don't have a particular project to share, except perhaps my career long vision about the role of libraries at the heart of scientific progress. And anyone who's been looking at the news over the past few months will, of course, have been tracking headlines about the various crises brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and it doesn't take too much searching on Google to find lots of headlines about the potential impact on higher education and on research. And we could spend a lot of time feeling very perturbed by the crisis mode in which we find ourselves. Uh, we were just talking before we started about China and I very deftly slotted in a slide about China um, showing the characters for the word in Chinese of, or the Chinese characters for the word crisis. And John Kennedy played around with that a little bit, talking about a crisis, uh, being aware of the danger, recognizing the opportunity, because apocryphally, the two characters that make up the word crisis represent danger and opportunity. Although Wikipedia, that source of all things truthful, tells me that in fact, the second character is not opportunity, but a change point. And I actually think that in the current context, that is a much more significant point for us. Because as you can see on the slide, um, over the past few months, um, uh, my colleague tells me that you're still seeing my title slide. So let me go back to the Chinese one just so you can see that. Hopefully you can see now um, the Chinese characters. Can Sean maybe give me a thumbs up Yep, great. Okay. Uh, so th this um, notion of crisis and th the characters for danger and opportunity, but I had moved from there to think about that change point and what we have seen over the past few months about how COVID-19 has driven digital adoption in manners that are completely unprecedented. Um, companies like Amazon, who were well established and other newer entrants in the place talking about 10 years growth of e-commerce deliveries in eight weeks. Disney launching a service and grabbing audience share in five months that took Netflix seven years to achieve. And I don't think we should pretend that these changes in behaviors are confined to our domestic lives. We need to think about what this might mean as we look to the big picture around data sharing open science in the research community. Peter Drucker warned us many years ago that at times of turbulence, uh, we shouldn't worry about the turbulence, but we should make sure that we don't act in the way we did yesterday, 
but think about how we might behave in the future. In libraries, we need to, and we have been already, of course, get beyond the notion that the library is the building full of books and journals. And our interplay in the research world has changed dramatically in recent years. And this is tremendously important, playing back to um, one of the earlier talks this afternoon about the volume of data and publications that we have seen generated during the course of the pandemic. We heard this morning from Lily and Bo representing Dimensions, and they list 160,000 publications this year on COVID-19. A couple of thousand data sets, six and a half thousand clinical trials, and so on. This world doesn't fit into the world of the black and white library. And as we think about the post pandemic future, we need to strike a balance between what worked before and what needs to happen if libraries and librarians are to continue to be valued partners in the research process. Those of you who have seen me talk in the past um, might have seen me use this slide before, I use it quite often to represent a model in which the library's traditional focus on research outcomes has been expanded by the digital transformation to allow us to recognize, capture, curate, share the artifacts and products of the research process, the activities that take place before the formal end of research writing up of outcomes, as well as the products of the aftermath of the research process. That poises us beautifully for a future world in which AI will dominate. Um, Sundar Pichai from Google Alphabet made this great point. In the teens, we were building a world that is mobile first. In the 20s, we will be shifting to a world that is AI first. And as we've seen and heard today on, from a number of speakers, that is absolutely where we are at. And as we think about the potential of AI, we need to recognize the importance of sharing data to power the acceleration and the development of AI technologies. And all of that, and this is a very subtle plug for tomorrow's event, please come back tomorrow. Open science is a critical part of that process because that fosters the culture and community of data and publication sharing that makes all of this possible. I was on a call a few months ago with some um, leading administrators in this country who had been surprised by the resilience and preparedness of the academic community to share data and publications during the pandemic. And they recognize that there is no going back. We have entered a world now where data sharing and open science are the norm. And therefore it's important that we recognize inside our communities the sorts of work that my colleagues at CMU have been doing as an illustration, those worlds of open science and data collaborations inside an institution. But also to recognize that we are but one part of a global community of research that is generating and is ready to share data to advance the world's research, to power the AI work of the 2020s. And what we need to do is build the infrastructure and the communities so that those who are the experts in the disciplinary domains have the infrastructure ready to hand. I'm reminded of something that came out 20 years ago, an ad from Hewlett Packard that said that what the internet needs is an old fashioned librarian and time has moved on. But I think that sentiment maybe is right that we in libraries are potentially at the heart of this community of data sharing. Maybe not this kind of library, but there is a library out there that is waiting for the next wave of community building and we are ready to help. I am going to hand over to the next speaker. I'm happy then to um, discuss with my colleagues as we move into open discussion. Back to you, Sean. Thanks, Keith. Um... Let's switch over now to Allison, and uh, maybe she can start with telling us about her background. 
<laughs> literally. Uh, yeah, literally, literally talking about the background. Um, yes, I suppose that is a very good start to my the context of my talk, which is as an environmental scientist. So I've been a, an academic and a researcher for many years. Um, and my hair doesn't quite give me away yet, but I'm working on being brave enough to go grey. Um, but anyway, um, uh, yes, so I was an environmental scientist engaged in uh, long-term monitoring and large continental-wide uh, data, database uh, collation uh, from 1870 right through to today of uh, ecosystem plot data. And this particular site here is one of my personal field sites which is, um, there's the wonderful Pacific Ocean just above my head. Uh, that's the, the, the dunes, it, it, it's a coastal dune situation. And this is a high, a barrier, what is called a barrier dune swamp, which I monitored for 20 years um, for water abstraction for the local human community and for mining. So very contentious areas and, it's one of those reasons, one of the reasons why I'm particularly passionate about the, uh, the need to conserve data and also to particularly save it in a way that it can be reused. And I started in the 1980s. Uh, we started monitoring this uh, in 1989, 88, 89. Um, and I'm just monitoring, we're just redoing a paper at the moment of just three surveys um, in this case uh, the case of this recent paper is a qualitative survey of human beings and their opinions and I must say the amount of comparable data in supposedly replicated surveys is the minority of the data that was collected so you know I suppose when you've got inanimate things, oh no, it's got nothing to do with the subject, it's got everything to do with the discipline and the rigor. So I think I'll um, stop that and I will share my slide, my slides, and I will do it via, hopefully, uh, via uh, the full screen. So can you see, is that filling in your whole entire screen and your world or not? Or well, I've just stopped it now. There we go, I'll fill your entire screen as well. Okay, so one of the other things about my slide is that I've got a, um, a logo behind me, which is the Terrestrial Ecosystem Research Network, which was established in 2009, which is why I left my academic job because I believe so passionate, and my tenure <laughs> and my superannuation, because I believe so um, passionately in the importance of community, data, conservation, repositories, and enablers. Um, and uh, I've come, been away and I've come back to the Terrestrial Ecosystem Research Network. So what I've got here are some interesting, uh, I suppose, logos on this slide that um, describe where I'm coming from. And I'm not going to talk about a particular project and Sean, I will have to watch the time because I'm, there it is, I've got the time there. Um, because I, I don't have terribly many slides and I could talk an awful lot. Okay, so at the moment, I'm working in a number of, in a couple of major uh, projects. Uh, one is, uh, is, is the Terrestrial Ecosystem Research Network. I'm really an ecosystem research analyst for that. So I dip in and dip out and make commentary and wise, wise pronouncements. Um, but it is great to be back to help this thing that I think is so important. The Terrestrial Ecosystem Research Network is an e-observatory, very similar to MEON, which you can see in my lovely uh, yin and yang diagram there, which was, I created for the Parsec website about an article we did with MEON, with the Atlas of Yin on uh, Elephant in the Room. It's a lovely it's a blog from Germany. And I was particularly interested in, in, okay, so build it, will they come? As one of my friends says, build a data repository, build an e-observatory, who is actually going to use it and how do you engage? And the particular topic that we were talking about in that blog was synthesis centers. So 
I left my job as an academic uh, to set up the first synthesis centre in the Southern Hemisphere, the one in Australia called ACES, the Australian Centre for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis, which has since stopped. But the whole point was to um, use that as an engagement for this Beagley Observatory, which was serving up supposedly lots of wonderful machine um, generated on the most part uh, data about the environment. Um, the Atlas of Living Australia is a consortium of museums. And in fact, I was uh, data one um, is, is a bit of a morph between um, some of these discovery organisms like the Atlas of Living Australia and the organisms, the organisms that uh, generate their own data like NEON or to a large extent like TURN. So I was very happily involved with Data One that you'll see there. And if you don't know much about Data One, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in the future. But the synthesis centers are, are a very interesting way to, and have been, to help the average scientists from whence I came, who you know, get, goes round up to their knees in swamps, ruins your toenails, by the way, um, or in rainforests or whatever, and gets them to engage from their quite often quite onerous uh, work uh, that absorbs them to actually thinking about the future and sharing and that sort of thing. Um, of course, on the way to being involved with TURN, I was involved with the research, I became involved with the Research Data Alliance, which is a quite inspiring thing for an environmental scientist to belong to and to visit because you if you have a little periphery, I know I must learn more about data. The RDA is like an inject of blood transfusion um, of, of people who think about that sort of thing. Um, and latterly, I've been involved in a project funded by the Belmont Forum, uh, which was a one-off initiative on the, um, the science-enabled e-infrastructures and how you can do that. And we've got a particular project, one of three of which I'm very proud, uh, which is called Parsec. Um, and I won't talk any more about the acronym, but it's a wonderful acronym um, and <laughs> isn't about um, a wonderful physical um, molecular idea. Okay, so um, I suppose just to re-emphasize, I'm particularly involved with the community. Um, one of my uh, graphic designer relatives uh, generated for me those lovely little logos on the left-hand side of the screen. I think it's the left-hand side for you. Um, to explain at a um, semantic web conference in Austria, and Deborah McGuinness was there. It's one of the keynote speakers. I believe she's probably here today, which is just wonderful. Um, to, to kind of show the continuing gulf in many ways. If you want to be a good scientist, you've really got to engross yourself in what you're doing. And the difficulty is how to bridge that gap. And, and yes, I think uh, I pick up on what Keith said. Yes, things are vastly improving, but it's actually interesting. One of the projects that we are continuing to do with Data One, we're tying off phase two of the 10 years of the Data One existence. Um, uh, has shown, and this is letting the cat out of the bag a bit, that in fact there was a tremendous burst of enthusiasm in the community up until 2015, and since then it's kind of sat. So it isn't a matter of build them and uh, we're, we're pondering upon why this is the case, that in fact maybe the researchers thought, yeah, this is a good idea, just like me, wonderful. Now, well, I'm still busy doing my research and I'm not going to do much more after that. And maybe the infrastructure and the deliverables that will enable the people who generate the data that is being shared is not there yet. It hasn't matured enough yet. So we've, I've got a bit into the data maturity pathway, but not for all these organisations, but for individuals and how you facilitate that. And we're exploring that in Parsi. Um, you'll note that with Data One, there's a little picture of me there. One of the ambitions of Data One, uh, it was a, a member node sort of structure, a collaborative participatory structure uh, to serve up information and data. And um, I was very pleased to have been instrumental for the Australian connection. But of course, like many such connections, um, they don't always last forever. 
Okay. Allison, sorry to yes. interrupt. Um, Time? Yeah. Do you do you yes. mind if we sort of move along and we can um, move along? We're, we're going to try. Along. We'll no we'll try to share out these um these yes. URLs and the slides, of course. So uh, so should yeah. I just proceed with the next two, which won't be long, or shall I stop? Do you mind? Do you mind if we go ahead and move on? Yes, okay. that's absolutely fine. All right. Absolutely I'm sorry. Fine. We we just no, didn't give ourselves enough time here. Fine. So I will stop sharing. There we go. So you don't All see right. anything. That's good. I think you've got the general picture. Thank yes. <laughs> There's a lot to talk about, clearly. Yeah, uh, Lucy, Lou, do you want to go ahead? Sure. We've already heard from you today. so. Uh, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I think I can just take a few minutes to talk more broadly about um, my role and my interest in open science. Um, so uh, again, I'm, I'm Lucy. Uh, I'm a young investigator at the Allen Institute for AI, which is a nonprofit research center based in Seattle, Washington. It's founded by the late Paul Allen. And the mission of the Institute is sort of to um, apply AI to uh, various aspects of uh, research and, and especially to support researchers um, by releasing a lot of uh, open source tools and methods uh, from things like computer vision to natural language processing uh, and uh, data resources. So specifically, I work on the semantic scholar team within uh, AI2, which is what we call um, our institute. And uh, so the semantic scholar is kind of like a publicly available literature search engine. So it attempts to make scientific literature more discoverable for uh, users, for um, uh, for people who are interested in uh, learning more about these subjects. And we work with publishers and other community groups to uh, gather that data and kind of make it available. So um, the thing that I care about here is making sure that open access materials uh, in the scientific literature are widely available so that people can conduct research using uh, these materials. So not all papers are open access. Um, I think a lot of us have are privileged to work in universities or other systems that have lots of subscriptions to uh, journals, um, but not all of us do. So uh, there are many out there who are kind of limited in the research that, the, that is kind of available to them, even though a lot of this research is funded through um, like public or governmental funding. So uh, it, kind of in this, um, in the span of trying to make open access materials more available, uh, I think we, uh, I talked briefly about this in, in my earlier talk, but STORC is one of the projects that we've um, released. It's the Semantic Scholar Open Research Corpus, where we make uh, 12.5 million uh, open access papers readily available to the public in a structured machine readable way. Um, and uh, CORD-19 is kind of a, a particular use case of that. So CORD-19 is the COVID-19 open research data set, which we released earlier this year, um, which uh, I talked about earlier. So uh, maybe quickly I can um, discuss some of our learnings from releasing the CORD-19 data set uh, and kind of some of the ways that maybe we would do things differently if we uh, had a chance to do this again. So, so for a little bit of background, we were, um, asked to release the CORD-19 data set by the White House uh, Office of Science and Technology Policy. Um, and we were given only six days to turn out the first version of the data set. So in some ways we released this open data set, but there were lots of things that were maybe wrong with the earlier versions uh, that we had to kind of incrementally uh, correct. But all of that is now in the data record, right? Like people have used versions of this data set that have, um, that have these issues. Uh, so, I guess one thing that um, uh, definitely can't emphasize enough, uh, but when releasing data and systems, it's really important to maybe document as early as possible. And at the very beginning, we tried to build a community around the data set using something, it's an open source tool called Discourse, which is a forum and chat uh, tool, uh, which connects people who are maybe interested in working on the same problems. And um, if they're, for example, annotating the data, they can share those annotations um, and try to reduce effort. So this course worked fairly well at the beginning when there was tons of energy around CORD-19. But over time, people um, kind of like, there, there were questions that were being answered in discourse, but weren't super discoverable on the data set release page and, and things like that. So um, there, there's a lot of documentation that we ended up having to 
distribute many times through many channels and not uh, in a very centralized location. So it's very, very important to do that. And for a lot of the systems using Core 19 and other similar data sets, um, they actually post-process the data a lot, but it's very hard to find this information on the, the, the sites of these systems. So this leads to the problem of like poor reproducibility. Someone can come along and not really know what you did with the data or how um, a system maybe arrives at a, uh, like an answer to a question. Um, so that, that information is really important to surface as well. And then the um, other thing, but maybe the last thing I can talk about here before turning it over to Ross. Um, uh, earlier in session three, I think Imran uh, mentioned some issues around licensing of these data sets. So bringing, bringing this back to open access considerations. So something that, um, that we really had to think hard about for Cord 19 is uh, making sure that we provide uh, appropriate provenance and licensing, licensing information for the documents in this data set. So the data set was originally supposed to only release, we're essentially trying to release the full text information for open access papers only. Um, but this information can be a little bit unclear. So for example, there can be a preprint of a paper that's subsequently published in a non-open access journal. So we really wanna choose the version of the paper that provides maybe the most open access rights to it. Um, and uh, so this, this was a bit of a challenge in creating the data set as well. And uh, you know, licensing is very hard. Something I worry about a lot uh, that's been happening lately is the proliferation of these non-creative commons licenses in the scientific literature for COVID-19, uh, for like COVID-19 literature. And I think maybe there are things that we uh, could do in this space to prevent that from being um, kind of the, the common thing uh, going forward. Turning it back to Sean. Thanks, Lucy. Um... Ross, I heard a few of things, a few things said there that sound like they might be, uh, um, might uh, sort of ring true with you guys too. So yeah, uh, especially, yeah, totally, uh, especially as it pertains to licensing. Uh, I, I'm, I'm one of the, I, I, I think I'm the only one on this panel that is coming from the commercial side of the house as we speak. Um, I actually found some slides that I can walk through also, so we can, we can jump into a few slide things too. Um, I'm not normally much of a slide guy, but let, let's throw in, let's throw it together anyways. So um, let me, let me give some context just, just for my background to start. So my name is Ross Epstein. I'm the chief of staff at a company called SafeGraph. Um, and we've spent, and I have spent a disproportionate amount of time since March, uh, giving away as much data as possible. Um, which has been very fun and also very challenging uh, and giving it away to as many academics as possible, which has been great. And hopefully this is a, hopefully this will be fun and you guys can tell me what we've done right and wrong and a bunch of good and a bunch of good stuff. So um, let me just give some background on SafeGraph just to start. Uh, we, uh, SafeGraph is just a data company. So all we do is we provide data sets about places. Uh, the joke I like to make is all we do is we sell expensive CSV files. That's it. We don't build applications. We don't build models. We like to say that we power the innovators. So when we talk about access to the academic community, as well as access to anybody who is working uh, to fight against, uh, working to do research for COVID-based purposes, right? This this rung true to the ethos that that is SafeGraph. Um, when uh, the products, again, focus around places, they, they funnel themselves into three core data sets. We've got a list of points of interest in the United States and some in Canada where consumers can spend money or they can spend time. So things like the park, the hospital, the pizza shop, the Starbucks are all sort of points of interest. Then we use geometry. So we build a, build a, we build a polygon for the building footprint. And we take what is uh, the largest commercially available panel of mobile devices that, uh, and we use anonymized GPS pings to aggregate that to foot traffic data. So as you can imagine, aggregated foot traffic data to points of interest in the time of COVID is an exceptionally useful tool for people to help uh, for, 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 for research purposes. Um, and we, so historically we'd always had an academic program um, where it was very, it was very small. Like if a couple, if folks who had come over and asked for access, we would ha happily give it, but it wasn't something that we were pushing or promoting in any way, shape or form. We thought it was good for the ecosystem. Um, 
and then realized that if we're going to do it, we might as well do it. So that uh, we spun up what we what at the time we called the, the COVID-19 data consortium, where we actually, of course, SafeGraph was promoting and, and giving away our data sets for, for any of these research purposes. But we were actually doing a lot of the hard work to work with other partners and other commercial level data set providers to bring their data sets in so that there was sort of one centralized repo to do, not, of course, not one centralized repo, but a semi centralized repo where uh, there were multiple different data sets that could be used for, for research purposes. So these existed across uh, real estate data, uh, tr tr uh, credit card transaction and debit card transaction data, things like payroll data. So a bunch of really interesting data sets that could be used for, for a myriad of different research purposes. Um, and then, of course, more than just data was actually providing, and, and I think many of the, you are uh, on this panel know this, but data isn't the only thing, it's also the community that's part of it, right? And making sure that you're not just providing data out into the ether so that, uh, right, you need to make sure that there's documentation with it, that there's support with it, that you're, that you're providing the resources and the utilities so that folks can actually do interesting things with that data. It's more than just, and yes, good documentation is the start to that, but we wish it was, I think all of us wish that just good documentation would be enough to answer everybody's questions. It's around how do you make sure that when people are coming with questions, you can ask them. Um, so that actually that, that actually funneled into, uh, I, I'm, I'm laughing now, but it's funneled into a Slack group. And so we have now up to 5,600 individual uh, uh, researchers who are in all sitting in this like Slack group together. And Sean, I'm joking because you're, you, we've got a quote from you down there in the bottom left um, on this deck for some reason. And, uh, but it's, but it's a, but it's a great community of, of, of organizations and, inst and individuals who are working together to, to build a bunch of, uh, do a bunch of research as part of this. Um, these are just some of the partners that we've gone ahead and been able to bring in. So everything from other data providers to technology providers so that you can, if you needed to throw all your stuff into a Databricks notebook, you really have the ability to do that um, quickly and with some amount of free credits so that you could compute uh, and you had to compute resources if you needed to. Um, and what's awesome is that we've seen a huge amount of content come out of this, right? On the order of something like 100 academic research papers come out um, with uh, with some attribution to SafeGraph or the or the other uh, sort of data providers that were part of the uh, that that were part of this consortium. So um, I speak to this from a very operational basis, less of an academic and research focus. Um, but it was it, it was really great. The, beyond just academia, there was. There's a whole lot of public sector based work that's going on in, in, in the consortium, everything from the from the, the federal government the agencies in which you would know down to the local municipal governments and counties who need to understand hey if i'm uh, how are my uh, how are my constituents and my community members uh, listening to things like social distancing measures. And are they going out into into their their local economies and are they spending money and are they visiting these types of things and, and are we seeing too many people at the park, these types of and these types of really interesting insights that can come about just from a local and community level. Um, that's that's all that I've got from a content based perspective, but um, but uh, yeah, let me know if you I, I think Sean you're going to open it up to questions, maybe now, but. Uh, yeah. All right. Um... Lots of different perspectives. Um, we could talk about any one of those points for probably a couple hours each. Um, we do have a question uh, that comes from uh, one of our panelists, actually, about, um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paraphrase a little bit. Um, Allison is interested in the status of preprints and the quality of them and the data associated with them. So I'm going to twist that a little bit to say, um, how do you, um, in various communities that are data uh, intensive, uh, where you're trying to provide data for reuse, how do you monitor and uh, catalog and use that to change how you're approaching your community? Um, how do you monitor the um, uh, the research the research output or the the output uh, from those communities? And I guess each, at least three of you have something probably to uh, to offer on that topic. So, uh, Ross, you you talked about it a little bit already. Yeah, 
Uh, I, I, so I'll, I'll talk with a, 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 I'll, I'll tackle a couple of things there. One is um, we, we had made a, and this was an interesting sort of tactic, but we had made a decision that we wanted to actually, we, of course, when you've done all this hard work for a paper, you want to evangelize it and, and market it off. So we actually offered up how, how our sort of internal marketing and, and PR groups would help amplify the coverage uh, of which them uh, of which they may want to push something out, right? And so, uh, of course, it, it's hard to continuously promote this type of stuff. But uh, especially when it was uh, between April and June, right? We had a whole lot of press-based uh, organiz uh, like major first-tier press publications who were coming to us and were asking, "Hey, what are the interesting data? What what are we seeing? What are we actually seeing out there?" And instead of we really like as SafeGraph, as the entity SafeGraph who is creating these data sets, we didn't have we didn't have answers, right? We have we create data sets, but ultimately all the, the academic community and the research community were the ones who were actually deriving insights as part of it. So we were actually all we were doing, we were middle middlemanning and making and making uh, introductions to major tier one press publications, the New York Times, the Washington Post. Um, all these organizations were, with the Wall Street Journal were coming to SafeGraph, and then we would just say, "Hey, talk to the talk to the academic community. Talk to this person who had a really great paper paper about political political partisanship and social distancing, right? Uh, and how that might and of course that's a very sort of buzzworthy and and clickable sort of uh, something for the, for 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 the media. But it, it was a really great way to 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 make sure that people were were promoting their work and their preprints early on because they could get very quick feedback uh, from the market, from the press, from a lot of these different things. It was a, it was a different tactic than I think uh, than than what what some of the more academic communities might and what you guys might think about when it comes to preprint based feedback. But uh, but that was one of the things that we found semi interesting for us. Um, is it okay if I chime in a bit here? Uh, so uh, maybe I, I think that's that's a really uh, great point, Ross. I, maybe I can speak to the uh, opposite direction of coming from academia and seeing these preprints proliferate, uh, especially in, in the current COVID epi uh, epidemic, and um, maybe wanting to push back a bit against the amount of certainly like press coverage that is placed on these arguably unfinished uh, and unreviewed works. Um, so preprints, like, I think preprints are a complicated matter because they are also very different depending on what field you're used to working in. So um, uh, I can speak about computer science and biology, medicine, biomedical domain because those are the ones I'm more familiar with. In computer science, preprints have been established for a very long time and they generally are considered slightly higher quality um, because people tend to read them and immediately build up on top of the work that's in them. I'd say in biomedicine, preprints are relatively newer. I'm not, which doesn't necessarily have direct implications just because uh, there's, there's, they're less commonly used now. Um, but the work that's being published in places or released in places like BioArchive and MedArchive do tend to be more unfinished work and they are not reviewed. Um, and although they are being included in data sets like Port 19 or probably like safe in, incorporated into SafeGraph. Um, there's a sense that uh, they haven't been subject to the rigors of peer review uh, to make sure that the methods are reasonable, that the results are uh, reasonable based on whatever methods were applied. And it's been somewhat problematic. Um, I've seen a number of art articles kind of published based on preprint results that maybe ended up being um, not like, like shown to be not quite uh, as uh, like, not quite as strong or uh, didn't really hold up when expanded to a larger data set or something like that. Um, so this is a, definitely a problem. And another problem related to preprints that uh, we're still trying to address is how to link preprints with an ultimately published version of the paper. So like not all preprints reach that point in life of becoming peer reviewed and published, but many do. Uh, like for, for many, like a preprint is, is work in progress. Um, so that's, uh, that's also somewhat challenging um, when you have multiple versions of essentially the same publication, some of which uh, like are altered a lot before they um, reach their kind of like final ultimate form. 
Uh, well, Jim, yeah. just, just put a note in that uh, we have Richard Siever, the, the co-founder of BioArchive and MedArchive speaking tomorrow. So show up and hear, hear his two cents worth as well. Uh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead, Keith. Uh, maybe I, I could just throw in a, a couple of points. Firstly, I had shown the um, data screen from Dimensions, which was aggregating the publications on COVID-19. And just from very crude arithmetic on my part, uh, you know, tens of thousands of those papers are preprints. Uh, and I think that illustrates the, you know, the, the, the positive and the negative. Um, Undoubtedly, peer review is an important part of scientific communication. Um, and there is an element of trust between authors, editors, reviewers, and readers um, that peer review brings about. On the other hand, preprints, I think, have really flourished during the pandemic because they are a mechanism through which researchers are able to disseminate their research their findings, their data quickly and accessibly to allow others to build upon that early work to foster collaborations and communities sticking with the theme of, of this panel. Uh, and and I, th I think that you know, as long as there is a clear health warning that these preprints have been released without peer review, without editorial scrutiny and acceptance that some findings might be unreliable and potentially dangerous for public health, then the scientific community, I think, has the opportunity to treat preprints as an important part of the move to open science and perhaps to think about how open science can be built upon in a world where observations are being shared in real time during the experimental process, never mind written up as a preprint before peer review. And perhaps all of that ties together to say that the pandemic has had a very positive effect on collaborative research on a global scale. We're seeing institutions collaborate that have never worked together in the past. And that rapid publication of ideas and findings supports not only the scientific community, but the public interests um, recognition of research at this time. But coming back full circle to show there's no easy answer, um, all of that has certainly led to some high profile retractions. Those of us who have been in the scientific communication business for a long time recognize that retractions are part of, of scientific communication. So I, I think it really is about accepting and encouraging that preprint sharing, but treating with caution. So I got there and there's always a danger of thinking out loud. So I, I, I just, uh, I was yeah. like, absolutely. Uh, I mean, uh, arguably like it's much healthier for the community to have a conversation about a preprint discover that is problematic and have that, um, like have the authors modify the methods or the results before publication, rather than you know, encouraging that uh, these, you know, not all published papers are canon. Many uh, ultimately end up being not reproducible. Can I, um, can I say something, Sean? Yeah. Oh, I was gonna say, Alison, I, I actually have a question um, sort of aimed at you. All right. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe I can ask and then you can finish. I, I think we're gonna end up finishing up about now, but I mean, in, in terms of the last question. So the last question was um, related to the, the, um, the need for sustainability um, in, the, in an era where data sharing um, remains sort of constant, but uh, data consumption seems to be growing uh, you know, almost exponentially. And for someone who's been working in, this, in, in the field of data, um, sharing for 20 plus years. Um, I'd be curious to hear what your thoughts are on, on data sharing, sustainability and data consumption. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes, um, I'll try and compose a quick answer. Um, I have no great faith in sustainability. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, we've been experiencing 
a history of people setting up repositories and them not being, for example, and to, to share their data because their community is totally different or some other reason. But hearing from some of the people involved in the Core Trust Seal, for example, you know, um, the lifespan of even the best repositories is often very limited. And I was interested in the previous discussion, there's a lot of reliance in this open data world on salaried researchers who are able to have the freedom to share their thoughts and share their data. And I think that's quite fragile and it needs concerted effort to maintain it. I mean, I've got a suite, a special issue of a journal uh, that referred to the reported work of 700 or so, 300 or so people, and that website has been taken down. I've served up data on farm forestry and a consortium and a collaboration for the um, carbon credits back in the 90s and the 20s and the university library as soon as I left took it down. So I, I, I think it's great what I hear. I'd be interested about COVID, how much that ripple effect goes beyond the medical community. I'd be interested in how, I mean, this used to happen in conferences to some extent. Um, COVID has helped that, but for all researchers, it's uh, lots of um, exchanges occurring remotely without large fees to attend a conference. It's wonderful. But, and, and so maybe that will continue. But um, yeah, I just, I, I do think there needs to be a real effort to understand that the infrastructure and the processes behind this do need active support. Hope that's a reasonable answer. I think it's pretty reasonable and, and uh, very honest. And uh, yeah. Anybody else have anything to add there? Well, I was going to ask, how, so as, as I probably, that, that uh, as sort of one of a, a newer entrant into this sort of community aspect to it, I understand that, that thing uh, and, and your concerns exp like very directly because um, it's, it's, it's hard to maintain. How do you suggest sort of when when some commercial organization realizes that, hey, well, we have an asset that we want to give to the broader good in some way, shape or form, and we need uh, and, and we'll tie two of our topics together around licensing that Lucy was talking about, where there are license restrictions and uh, when you have a business around it, how do you suggest sort of moving exceptionally fast um, and being able to get this out as fast as possible? to sort of working with the sort of other operational based infrastructure that might exist currently and the ecosystems that are there, right? Uh, what, what, do you, what do you, what what might you suggest to a new entrant? Well, um, thanks for that question. Um, I think the, uh, one of the advantages in the kickoff of COVID I've just mentioned is that it has opened up in many ways, a way for many more people to participate and collaborate. And you could, quite happily use that um, collaboration that may more, be more virtual to speed up and to create a new evaluation procedure. We mentioned, Keith has mentioned the, the kind of the totally imperfect review process that the journals have been trying laboriously to, um, to employ. Um, and reviewers are increasingly hard to find. The idea of the preprint or before that there was something else where you put something up and you got comments um, was to get comments, but you've actually got to get those comments. The number of preprints I've seen, there's an 18 month one up there at the moment that I want to refer to. Personally, this has not had a single comment. So you've got to create, get that community to pay attention to this and to see it as a new, a new way of trying to secure your research and to speed up. And I, I think it's to speed up the outcomes of, of some of the good and to knock on the head some of the poorer research. And I think you can do it. The difficulty will be governance of that because we all know in academia, the, um, the, the, the cliques, the clubs that feed off each other. 
and um, will reinforce uh, their own line. And so some governance and thought needs to be involved. But I think um, there is an opportunity for that. Um, I am concerned about people like you, Ross, and I'm thinking of Fig Share and various other wonderful things that uh, to be sustainable, sometimes it involves a big, uh, a big organisation to come and gobble you up. If your idea is that good, you'll retire a millionaire and go to the Bahamas, um, but and maybe your work will continue because you have that great idea. Um, uh, the analogy here is the microbrewing industry in Australia to take something completely different. Um, you know, the Anheuser or Bert, Bert, Bert or whatever it is will come and buy up the craft brewers, um, and you know. It's only the, the rare one who wants to live in a poor way that will make it their idea sustainable. But, but on the other hand, if you can make the big people uh, adopt some of the practices and learn, that can also be another pathway. So there's two. Maybe I could just jump, jump in with the thoughts there. Um, you, you remind me, Alison, of a project that I co-founded 15 years ago, it was the Australian Partnership on Sustainable Repositories. And we always had to be careful not to call it retainable suppositories. Uh, and the that was an early recognition as we started to build institutional and disciplinary repositories, that it was pointless creating a bucket that we poured lots of stuff into without any sense of long-term responsibilities and resourcing. And I think we still haven't cracked that one. It's great for a research project to say, thou shalt share thy data, but who's going to pay for that in 10 years time, in 50 years time? Are we going to leave that to archive.org or are we going to have a joined up approach? So I just wanted to, to mention that um, I'm conscious of time, uh, but Sean, all right, I, I'm, uh, I apologize to uh, the panelists uh, for uh, not allowing us to get it, get it uh, a lot of the meat um, and uh, to the audience for, um, uh, for just getting, scratching the surface here. But um, uh, I'd like to go ahead and kind of close the day. Uh, thank you to the panelists. Um, we have lots of communication uh, um, uh, means to reach out to the panelists otherwise uh, after this. Um, and if you have trouble reaching them, feel free to ping one of us, the organizers. Um, at this point, uh, feel free to head over to gather.town for um, the reception. And then just a reminder that tomorrow we have the Open Science Symposium uh, that uh, the instructions just came up in, um, uh, in the chat. So, so thank you all so much and uh, take care. Thank you. thank you very much. It was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Good night.